Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our webinar. Um, so while we wait for more participants to trickle in, uh, just a few logistics announcements. Um, everyone in the webinar, all the participants will be muted. If you have questions, please post the questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom tools uh, at your disposal. Um, also, if uh, we will handle all the questions at the end of the session. And well, I'm very excited to get things started uh, with, with some introductions. So first off, I would like to introduce Niraj Mehta from CPFD. Hello, Niraj. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, hi, my name is Niraj Mehta. I'm a solutions engineer here at CPFD Software. I originally started working in software development of Barracuda Virtual Reactor here at CPFD, but I've recently transitioned into a more client-facing role, uh, kind of inter interfacing between our global user community and our development team. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nilesh. And also, we have a very special guest, Frederick Safiriadis. Frederick. Yeah, thank you, Roque. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, as Roque mentioned, my name is Frederick. I'm a fluid mechanics specialist and partner at the uh, fluid mechanics consultancy EOTAC in uh, Denmark, Copenhagen. And uh, we've been working lately with uh, with both Rescale and Barracuda on a very exciting project that I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited to share with you guys a bit later on. Excellent. Thank you, Frederick. Welcome. And well, my name is Roque Lopez. I'm a senior um, customer success engineer here at Rescale. Uh, I'm I'm in charge of reaching out uh, to to our customers, to our enterprise accounts, working with them to be, make the most value out of the risk platform for their R and D uh, HPC needs. And well, we have been closely collaborating with both CPFD and Frederick, and I'm very excited to see uh, a little bit and learn more a, bit, a little bit about the solution and the results they're they're going to uh, present with us. Well, thank you so much. Without further ado, um, Niraj, can you take it off? I think you're first Will in do. the queue. Uh, so uh, thank you for the introduction, Roque. Um, so my name is Niraj Mehta, and I'm thrilled to kick off this webinar. Uh, we'll be discussing how the intersection of uh, uh, CFD software, GPU technology, and cloud computing resources allows engineers to better evaluate the particle behavior and hydrodynamics of complex multi-phase systems. Uh, first, I want to give a quick overview of CPFD software and Barracuda Virtual Reactor. Uh, CPFD software's flagship product is Barracuda Virtual Reactor, a CAE CFD software that models the hydrodynamics and thermochemistry of 3D fluid particle systems such as fluidized bed reactors. Uh, basically, it allows engineers to look inside their reactors, providing a whole host of benefits, such as the optimization of existing processes, uh, the reduction of risk for, uh, for unintended, unintended consequences of planned changes. Uh, the, uh, it can accelerate research and development and reduce time to market. Uh, for example, bridging the gap between the pilot scale and the commercial scale for uh, reactors. So uh, what makes Barracuda's Virtual Reactor special? For one, Barracuda Virtual Reactor operates in a niche that is simply not matched by other general purpose CFD packages. I'll get more into that shortly. Uh, furthermore, Barracuda Virtual Reactor is a full software package from preprocessor to solver to post-processor. And finally, what allows Barracuda Virtual Reactor to truly shine as a tool in an engineer's digital tool belt Barracuda Virtual Reactor is parallelized using NVIDIA GPUs, which has paved the way for the advancements we'll be discussing in this webinar. Uh, let's get into the unique aspects of the software. Uh, Barracuda Virtual Reactor is notable for considering both a continuous Eulerian fluid phase and a discrete Lagrangian particle phase, which allows for full definition of material properties. Uh, other tools uh, focus on certain phases and abstract the others through modeling assumptions. By having the fluid phase and solid phase as distinct phases, we can represent solid loadings from incred incredibly dilute particulate matter to maximally, de uh, maximally packed dense phases. Uh, Barracuda Virtual Reactor then tightly couples these phases 
uh, that tightly couples their physical, thermal, and chemical interactions. So fluid affects particles via drag, particles displace fluid, and the software allows for multi-phase heat transfer and intricate multi-component chemistry. Uh, this has made Barracuda Virtual Reactor the industry standard for several highly specialized processes in refining, cement, and many other fields. Um, I also want to mention the post-processing, which is done through the embedded industry standard CFD visualization tool TechPlot, as well as through auxiliary scripts. Next, as aforementioned, uh, Barracuda Virtual Reactor is paralyzed exclusively on NVIDIA GPUs, a collaboration that has proven fruitful for us and for our customers. Notably, this collaboration has reached new heights with the introduction of GPU computing to cloud platforms such as Rescale. And then finally, I have to give a quick shout out to our support team who offer the most in-depth support of any software support team on the globe. Uh, any question, no matter how specific, complex, or obscure, is handled by our team of expert engineers. I think uh, of all aspects of our company, this might be the one that truly sets us apart. Um, and with that, I would like to hand it off to Frederick of Aeratac, who will be discussing his team's unique application of Barracuda Virtual Reactor. Thank you very much, uh, Niraj. I'll just take over the screen. So hopefully you can now see a um, slideshow from me here. So thank you very much for uh, inviting me today to uh, to give a brief talk on one of our latest projects that involve both uh, Barracuda Virtual Reactor and Rescale on CFD analysis of sand and gravel filling in a seabed socket for uh, wind turbine tower foundations. Um, before we get into that, maybe I should just give a brief introduction to who we are at Aerotech. So we are a fluids mechanics uh, consultancy. We deal mostly with uh, CFD uh, simulations. We also do some uh, measurements and some normal dimensioning on paper and stuff like that. But we are a company uh, primarily based in, in, um, in Denmark, Copenhagen, where we have 13 employees at the moment working with uh, CFD. And that can be everything from modeling of, of uh, particles in a cyclone to a spray dryer uh, modeling to external aerodynamics on cars. Um, we do a lot of particle that flows within the process industry. And we also do a lot of simulations within the maritime industry, um, looking at uh, wave loads and uh, ship hull design. We have an office here in, in Copenhagen where, where I'm based. Um, and then we have recently opened one in, in Oxford in UK. Uh, focusing specifically on uh, design of vehicles and external aerodynamics uh, to basically expand our capabilities there. But we are a Danish consultancy, so of course most of our customers are Danish. I think you can probably recognize uh, Mask, F.S. Smith, uh, Carlsberg, um, but we also have customers in, in Europe, in, in uh, North America, South America, and, and Asia. And we are always on the lookout for new talent. So if you're interested in, in um, learning more about CFD and, and how we can um, help you to, to grow in that sense, or you're interested in a job, please uh, please visit our, our website at uh, aerotac.dk. So I think that briefly sums up um, the reason why I'm here and, and uh, sort of my stakes uh, in this. Um, what I will be spending the next 15, 20 minutes on is to go through one of our recent use cases, uh, which is focusing on this um, uh, sand filling into a, a seabed socket. But maybe just to, to introduce that. So we, we had a customer coming to us. Uh, they are basically in collaboration with a number of other uh, companies to build foundations for uh, monopile structures that in this case are used for gravity-based or simply monopile um, foundations for uh, wind turbine towers. And basically what you do there in order to make sure that the seabed you're installing the, the, the monopiles on is, is, has a strong foundation is that you drill holes. These are quite large holes that you then fill with both sand and gravel. And during that sand filling, you basically need to make sure that you get a nice distribution of the sand so you don't end up having large particles in one region and small particles in another region, basically to have a proper foundation. And uh, the customer that we're working with, of course, have some experience in doing that. Um, but for this specific, specific case, they needed to make sure that they could do it in a completely sort of sound way in terms of how they're actually filling 
And the way that they're supposed to fill this can be done in a number of different ways. Some are cheaper than others. And of course, we, they're eager to figure out how effective can we do it for the least amount of money. But the question is, how do you actually go out and you evaluate that? That's at the bottom of, of the sea. It's on a seabed. It's, it's very far into the ground. You can't just go down and, and pluck out uh, samples. And even if you could, just doing a full-scale test like that is, is going to be quite comprehensive and expensive. So they were asking, can we, can we develop a, a CFD model that we can actually use to predict how the filling behavior of the sand and the gravel into the socket uh, behaves based on three main parameters? So one is, of course, how well are the particles distributed in terms of uniformity? Um, also, when we are filling, what we're interested in is to have a quite level filling um, such that when we have the particles that are settling, they are not settling in a large pile. Uh, they are simply setting more or less flat. So, of course, we need to be able to evaluate that. And then the last thing is, of course, we're interested in keeping as much of the particles inside the socket and not losing too many of them to the surroundings doing filling. So those are the three sort of main parameters that we're interested in looking at when we try to develop a CFD model for this. So the, the socket is basically quite simple. So it's a, it's a large hole that goes maybe 30 meters or so into the, the seabed. And then on top of that, you basically place your vessel that our customer has, and then you have a long fault pipe attached to the vessel. And through that fault pipe, fault pipe that you see here in the middle part of the picture, you basically feed particles and, and you drive these particles uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with water. So you get a mix of, of particles and water. And these particles are the sand particles to begin with in the lower part of the socket. They have probably a, a diameter of, of uh, a half a millimeter or so, so quite large compared to, let's say, fluidized bed, which is what we normally use Barracuda for. And then you have gravel on top of that, which are even larger uh, in terms of particle size. Um, but still, they're quite small compared to the overall size of, of the socket. And that may, really makes for a challenge when we're trying to simulate that. So we, after the customer came to us and asked if we could do this, we had, a, of course, an internal discussion with the entire team at Aerotac to figure out how can we actually do this and what are the challenges in trying to model this. Um, so first of all, the time it takes to fill a hole with these amount of, of sand particles, we're not talking about seconds. We are not talking about minutes. We're talking about hours. So we have a very large temporal scale that we need to be able to cover. There could be some options of, of simulating only part of it, but in reality, what we're interested in is to try and simulate the entire process of the filling. So that's a challenge, of course. Then we're looking at quite large physical scales. That is in itself, when we're talking about CFD, can be tricky, but it's more the fact that you have small particles you need to resolve the motion of, uh, as well as you have this quite large dimension of the socket. So that, that, that difference in physical scales is, is really a challenge there. And then on top of that, we need to be able to predict to some extent the segregation or at least how the particles are differing in terms of where they're ending up in the socket. So we need to be able to simulate the entire particle size distribution to, to have both small and large particles. And then to make matters worse, we have a case where you're basically stacking or settling particles in the bottom part. Um, and then on top of that, in the filling part, basically we have low particle concentration. So we also need a model that can handle uh, high particle concentrations and low particle concentrations at the same time. And that's not so simple. Luckily at Aerotalk, we do a lot of these types of, I wouldn't say these types, but uh, we do a lot of particle lab and flows. And, and we have a number of different tools in our CFD toolkit that we can use depending on the type of problem. When we do spray dryers or cyclones that are sort of not heavily loaded, there are dilute conditions. We often tend to go for what we call an Eulerian Lagrangian approach. If we use a, a discrete parcel method, we often tend to neglect whatever collisions we have because it's very dilute conditions. But in this case, we actually have uh, quite a high uh, degree of contact between the particles. So basically that, that approach is out. Then we could do a DEM simulation, which is probably the one we thought of to begin with would be the, the, the suitable choice. But then again, we need a lot of particles in order to fill up the entire uh, socket. And then for this case, at least for the resources that we have available in the, the softwares that we normally use, uh, this simply becomes way too expensive, way too costly, way too uh, time consuming when we're looking at the overall uh, scope and, and sort of budget for the project. So the DEM in terms of speed is also out and that basically cancels out the entire Eulerian Lagrangian approach in that sense. 
Then often for fluid ice beds, which is um, sort of one of my great backgrounds here, uh, we use uh, this two fluid model for modeling the, the gas or the liquid and then the particle uh, phase. But in that sense, we, we can of course add multiple um, continua to represent more particle sizes. Uh, but in general, what would you what you do there is you represent the entire um, particle size by just a single representative particle size, and and um, that is is something we cannot do in this case because we need the entire particle size distribution. So that basically rules out that approach. And then we are left with the what we call the hybrid Eulerian and Lagrangian approach, and there are a number of these, but I think the most commonly used one is the multi-phase particle and cell methods (MPPIC), which is uh, something that is implemented in a lot of different softwares. Uh, we at Aerotag have a lot of experience in using it uh, within Barracuda, so CPFD software's um, uh, module. Uh, but still, even though we can check off, so we have uh, we're able to do that with a number of, of particles. We have the whole particle size distribution. We can account for both high and low particle concentrations within the same simulation. We still have this large temporal scale, which is a, a challenge for the, the type of resources that we have. So we need to partner up there with the Rescale platform in order to actually make it uh, feasible to run these simulations. But I think the combination of that basically means that we can we can actually solve this problem, um, which is not something that that um, was let's say readily available for, for any type of, of consultancies working with the standard DM or DPM uh, models. Um, I won't go too much into the details of the setup itself, um, but I brought one slide because it basically outlines that even though we have now the capabilities with Rescale and with Barracuda to actually do the simulations, it's still quite challenging to actually do. The geometry itself is quite simple, it's just a large cylinder, um, but we have a, a pipe, a full pipe, uh, that we also want to model to some extent. And I think the main interest from our customer was actually uh, of course, to do some sensitivity studies to see how are the particles actually behaving under different operating conditions. But as I mentioned before, there are many ways of doing this type of filling. Some are cheap, some are expensive. The traditional way that they normally do it or are asked to do it is by what we call a retraction filling approach. So basically you have the entire socket and then you have your, um, you have your fall pipe uh, placed right at the bottom, basically. So you have the outlet almost at the bottom of the socket. And then you, as you gradually fill in the particles, you retract the pipe. Um, that means that we get a nice smooth distribution often and we, we can keep all the particles within the socket. But it's very expensive to do so mechanically. So what they're uh, hoping to do or proposing was that, okay, let's, let's just leave the pipe at the top. So just two meters perhaps below uh, the seabed into the socket. And let's just, let's just pour the water and the, the particles in from there. That's a lot cheaper for us. It's a lot more simple. Um, if we can get the same type of results in terms of particle size distribution and these other parameters that we looked at, then we would be quite happy. So we need a model that can both simulate the fact or the, the case where you have a, a fall pipe that is fixed at the top, but also one where we're retracting the fall pipe. And that's not necessarily so easy to do in, in Barracuda uh, if you are to model and include the geometry of the fault pipe itself. So what we did instead was to use um, these quite nice boundary condition injectors that you can do a lot with in Barracuda. Often they're used for uh, simulating spargers and fluid as bed, but in this case, we could actually simulate the pipe, the fault pipe itself using these boundary condition injectors. So each of these injectors are placed in a plane and then you can put in a specific, or you can define a specific uh, volume flow rate or mass flow rate for the, the particles and, the, and the, the water for each of these. And then they make up this uh, single injector plane that we can then turn off as function of time to basically simulate the behavior of the retracting pipe. And then we can use the same setup for the top filling approach where we just place it at the top uh, and just have one injector plane. But naturally there are some simplifications we need to do here in order to be able to, to carry out the simulations. But with that, I think it was actually quite surprising how well this was working and also in combination with the, the Rescale platform, how quickly we actually, or the, the turnaround time on these simulations. So I think initially we started for a scope of two months having uh, maybe five or six simulations. And I think we ended up doing 12 or 15 simulations in total because things were just running so effectively and so fast, a lot faster than we were expecting. And we were actually able to do a number of sensitivity studies uh, this is uh, an excerpt of the, the simulation matrix that we did. So what we will be focusing on here today is, is the sand filling approach. So the bottom part of the, 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 
the socket. But on top of that, basically, comes gravel. And we also simulated that varying uh, different operating conditions in terms of the solid flow rate, um, the, uh, the, the, the amount of solid content that is, is being fed through the fault pipe. And we can even simulate with this quite nice setup with these boundary condition injectors, what happens if we have a, an emergency breakdown halfway through the filling? Can we then half an hour later or an hour later uh, start up the, 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 fill, the feeding again without having any troubles in terms of of the, the distribution and, and the, the, the performance of the, or the quality of, of the film. So for the, the rest of the simulator, the rest of the presentation, I'll just go through briefly some of the results that we see for comparing uh, the retraction filling approach to the, the top filling approach with the sand. Um, yeah, I, I forgot about the slide, uh, which is actually quite important because I think the reason we were able to run as many simulations as possible was um, due to the workflow that we have on Rescale. So I've only used Rescale a couple of times before, but it's, it's actually very easy to, to uh, get into this workflow and you can set up and run, start running a simulation within a few minutes. Uh, so basically for the Barracuda simulations, we just upload a, a zip folder with the, the files we need to run. We upload a Barracuda license file, and then you, you simply go in, you select the software, which in this case is is um, Barracuda Virtual Reactor. You write the commands that you need to uh, in order to run the simulation. So meshing and then run basically. And then you go in and you select your GPU. And that's like being a little guy in a candy shop uh, because you have a number of different ones to, to select from. In this case, we actually just used a single GPU with six cores, this Tesla V100. Uh, but you can also use uh, multi-GPU uh, settings that I think um, Niraj and Roke will touch upon later in the webinar. Um, but even with this quite simple setup uh, with, a, with just one uh, GPU, we were able to run these simulations uh, within six to 18 hours, which is as far as efficient for us in terms of the, the time scale or the timeline we have for the project. And then we actually also figured out that you can, add a, uh, you can upload uh, this post-processing scripts that makes it a lot easier for us to run these cases uh, more efficiently. So we, we did that so we could post-process. Uh, just after the simulation has completed without having to do that manually ourselves. And that really also helps the workflow when we're doing uh, a number of these types of simulations. So I have here on the right-hand side an animation that basically shows how the uh, socket is being filled. On the left-hand side, it's for the retraction filling case. And on the right-hand side, it's the top filling case. And then you see all the particles colored by the volume fraction. So if you have a volume fraction here uh, or particles colored by uh, red, that means they are settled. And then you see on top of that, you have these uh, blue particles, which means that they're basically swirling around in the dilute flow. Um, so a simulation like this, where we're simulating for maybe two hours or something like that, that's the time it takes to actually fill the socket. Uh, that uh, takes us about these yeah, 15 hours or so to do on the Rescale uh, platform with a time step of about a quarter of a, a second. And we actually end up using uh, about one or sorry, 8 million computational particles in this case, or clouds as we call it, Maracuda, uh, which is something that is just, I mean, that, that's unrealistic to do when you're, when you're trying to do it with a, a DEM solver, for example. The biggest difference between uh, these two cases that we actually see here is that for the top filling case, where we have the, the pipe uh, placed all the way to the top, we're actually losing some particles to the surrounding. Uh, which is not really the case for the, um, the retraction filling. If we put in a vertical slice down through the middle of, um, of the geometry, we can then evaluate what is the, the particle volume fraction on the cells themselves. And that um, ends up looking something like this. So what you're basically creating for the retraction filling case is sort of a bore when you have the, the jet of, of um, particles and, and water uh, hitting the, the, the region where you have the settled particles. And then you get this nice piling next to it. And what we're interested in seeing at the end is when we have completed the filling, we want sort of a very nice smooth horizontal um, settled layer of particles. And that's actually what we see. Uh, it doesn't look that way to begin with, um, but once we end up stopping the, the simulation or the filling, uh, we actually end up with a quite nice horizontal layer in, in both cases, which is something that Perhaps I was not expecting to be so pronounced, um, but according to our customer, that actually looks quite realistic. So we're, we're quite happy to, to hear that. Then one of the very nice features I think about Barracuda is we can actually go in for each time step or just as we're looking here at the end of, of one time step or the, the entire filling, we can go in and we can take out all the raw particle data. So we can for across the entire um, 
uh, fluid domain, we can go and we can sample across a little box, for example, and say, okay, what is the particle size distribution at this location? And we can do that for a number of location in actual uh, direction and in, in radial direction, and basically compare to see how are the particle size distribution within this little square box close to the wall or in the center, and how much does it actually differ from the original um, particle size distribution, the, the black dash line that we see in the middle. Um, and then we have, uh, by the customer, been giving some upper and lower bounds that we need to, or that we're hoping to at least stay within. So we can do that and we can evaluate that for different cases, depending on the filling method or the um, operating conditions to see where do we actually defer in, in these particle size distributions. And do we see a large segregation in some cases or in other cases? Uh, so on the left-hand side here, the two plots um, are shown for the retraction filling at basically looking at a small box uh, in the center part, that's uh, the top plots, and then uh, near to the, the wall in the bottom part. And if we compare the top filling on the right-hand side, basically what we're looking for is to see that these curves are more or less following the, the dash lines and that they're not uh, deferring too much. And what we basically see here is that that's really not the case, and you get more or less the same type of results for the top filling as for the retraction filling approach. Uh, we did this for a number of different sensitivity studies and cases, and we actually get quite big differences depending on how we're operating the, the filling. Um, so it's not, so there is differences that we're able to see and that, that basically means in this case, when we have the same operating conditions, retraction filling delivers more or less the same results as the top filling, which is a, a quite nice result for, for our customer. Um, so the last thing we were interested in looking at was how much of uh, the, the, the mass of the particles are we actually losing to the surroundings? So in the previous simulations that I showed before, we just had a small excerpt of uh, the surrounding domain uh, without any effect of uh, current. So often you will have uh, waves, you will have effect of, of current, and we try to sort of replicate that um, by simply increasing the size of the domain. We still do the simulation in the exact same way. We just increase the, the domain size outside of the, um, of the socket, and we apply a uniform velocity to represent the current of half a meter per second. And in that way, we can basically simulate to a, a more realistic extent how many particles are we actually losing during this type of filling. Um, and we were able to, to um, doing this uh, simulation, quantify also that how much sand are we actually using, uh, which in this case is actually quite small compared to the amount of sand we're using to fill the socket. So uh, that was also quite positive for, um, for our customer that they could use this um, to basically say, okay, the top filling approach actually works as well. We are losing perhaps more particles, but this is not a, an issue for, um, for the actual filling itself. So with that, I think I'll, I'll just spend a, a few minutes uh, concluding on, on this um, a project. So I think the main or the key customer takeaway here is that we could actually use a CFT simulation. It's not really validated because it's, it's very difficult to actually do measurements that we can use directly. Um, and I think that was not necessarily the, the, the purpose either, but it was more to see relative effects of uh, comparing, for example, the top filling approach to, to the... Um, the, the more costly uh, retraction filling approach. In this case, what we see is that the, the only difference is we might lose a few more particles for the top filling, but it's, it's, it's not that bad. And it's, it's a lot more cost effective for our customers to use. So they are now proceeding with that approach um, and some modified um, boundary conditions and filling conditions that we recommended based on the sensitivity studies. So I think that's a, a quite, nice, quite nice result for, for both us and, and the customer in, in this project here. And I think that is due to uh, the fact that we were able to, to use uh, Barracuda in combination with Rescale so we can do a lot more simulations within the time frame that we had. Um, and at the same time, using Rescale in this case basically meant that we didn't have to go out and buy A100 GPU cards or V100 GPU cards, which is quite, uh, quite a big, um, uh, cost for us to go out and procure and we don't have to manage that and we just have it on demand uh, as a quite flexible resource uh, since we're not doing that many uh, of these types of, of, uh, of simulations and I think also what really helped us to this project uh, to basically get started I think as, as Niraj also mentioned was that you're not just buying a, a license for Barracuda or, or paying for the rescale uh, platform in terms of hardware there uh, you're also really buying access to a, a great support team from CBFT software and Rescale that in this case really helped our workflow uh, so we could cut down on the amount of time I had to spend on actually uh, working on this project and, and troubleshooting. 
uh, which is of course uh, more than anything the most in, or some of the, the the interesting things for for me in terms of, of being a consultant and and trying to uh, make a good business case out of, of simulating something that is is this complex um, so with that i think that basically concludes my um, part of, of this webinar so uh, thank you very much for for listening in and i hope we we can have a discussion about some of this uh, a bit later thank you Great, that was amazing, Frederick. Thank you so much. All right, let's um, let me take over and share my screen. Oh, so, uh, actually, I think Roke, I think I have a, a few more slides before your section, if that's okay. <laughs> of course. Uh, then Niraj, to you. <laughs> um, thank you, Frederick, for that fascinating talk. That application area is really unlike anything we've ever seen before. And we are looking forward to seeing what your team will continue to do with Barracuda Virtual Reactor. And uh, before I hand this off to Roke, I just wanted to give a quick statement about what makes GPUs powerful for Barracuda Virtual Reactor specifically. Um, for a very broad overview, uh, what makes GPU parallelization so appealing? Uh, I think at a, for, uh, for one, GPUs have thousands of cores compared to maybe 100 or less in the most powerful CPUs. Therefore, to achieve thousands of calculations in parallel, you would either need to a costly distributed computing setup with dozens, if not hundreds of CPUs, or you could get two to four GPUs. Now, each GPU core will perform at a much lower rate in terms of floating point operations per second compared to those high-end CPUs, but the hardware will be significantly cheaper, and NVIDIA's CUDA toolkit, which is baked into their hardware technology, is engineered to specifically resolve these array-based calculations at a very, very efficient clip. And furthermore, as CPU speeds have been tapering off in recent times, GPU increases are still going steady. Moore's law, the rough observation that transistors in an integrated circuit double every two years, has failed to continue to translate that exponential trend to CPU speeds. GPU technology, however, is just getting better and better. Um, uh, Roke will uh, talk about this soon. And uh, for us at CPFD Software, our engineers spotted the potential for GPU acceleration over a decade ago. And with our first GPU release in 2014, we immediately saw a five to 10 uh, times increase over CPU speeds. Uh, by 2019, with hardware advancements from NVIDIA, as well as moving more of our solvers calculations to parallel, uh, notably chemistry, this number had spiked to over 60 times. And it's been a rocket ship ever since. That uh, far right bar on the previous chart is the middle bar on this current chart. And the next two bars represent the advancements in the three years since. We've added support for multi-GPU calculations, increasing the number of parallel calculations, as well as the problem size capacity in terms of VRAM. This plus the stunning capabilities of the latest NVIDIA chipsets, such as Ampere, have completely blown the doors off of what we used to think was fast. And because of our integration with the NVIDIA stack, whenever uh, new powerful hardware is released, those gains are immediately, uh, immediately realized by our solver without having to release a new version. We're now suddenly operating in a world where we're routinely seeing speeds several hundred times faster than top of the line CPUs when we use multiple top of the line GPUs simultaneously. And the benefits are multifaceted. Uh, obviously these simulations are faster, but what does that mean? Uh, faster simulations uh, translates to increased testing capacity. And furthermore, uh, we can now model higher fidelity models, uh, including simulations that were previously unapproachable in terms of complexity. Those are now not just possible, but practical. And finally, uh, and really kind of the point of this talk, let's discuss how access to HPC uh, GPU technology is better than it's ever been. This accessibility is key to delivering these powerful, fast simulations to end users such as Frederick. Uh, with regards to virtual reactor in the cloud, we're presently in a state where cloud computing is not just competitive compared to on-premise hardware, but in many cases, genuinely advantageous. Um, cloud computing offers uh, overflow capacity. There's an exactness to it. The amount of resources you need is the exact amount you'll use. You won't be lacking for resources and you won't have unused computational power sitting around either. And uh, you'll never be saddled with out-of-date hardware. You won't have an IT team constantly having to put in the new GPU cards and put the old ones in the bin. Uh, you won't have to upgrade physical machines. 
any simulation you run, you can guarantee that you're using the latest and greatest GPUs. And then finally, uh, Barracuda Virtual Reactor, which is typically licensed on year-long deals, now offers metered licensing. This is a recent development, and as a result, users can buy simulation time that corresponds exactly to how much GPU instancing they need. Um, and and uh, to segue into what Rogi will talk about, cloud instances are now roughly as fast as their physical counterparts, which is an exciting development for all of us. Virtual simulation is rapidly approaching minimal drawbacks. Uh, so with that, I would like to hand it off to Roke at Rescale, who will demonstrate how Barracuda Virtual Reactor performs on their platform. Excellent. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you. I think you guys have done my job a lot easier. <laughs> so we have gone through uh, a learning together about CPFD and Barracuda Virtual Reactor, uh, how it has been purposely designed a, with with GPU performance in 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 the forefront of of their of their product solution. And and from Arotac, this fantastic example for Frederick. Thank you so much. So I just want to wrap it up by giving you guys a quick uh, introduction about uh, Rayscale uh, and, and, and what we do. Uh, so let me start by saying just like, it doesn't matter what vertical industry you are, uh, our R&D uh, leaders are always working to try to find ways to accelerate uh, their, their simulations and finding new, new technologies with, with their simulations and their research. Um, and today we have a great example from Frederick about it. Um, so regardless of where you are in the in the journey of uh, moving or adopting uh, your R and D uh, uh, developments into into the cloud, uh, Rescale can help you get there. So of course we help you provision accelerated computing solutions uh, that are available in the cloud. We facilitate turnkey access to those kind of solutions, uh, and we have probably the widest uh, access to all the GPU capacity that there is in the cloud. As we work with many cloud providers and we supply our users with a cloud agnostic interface where as Frederick, as Frederick kindly put it, uh, he felt like a little kid in a candy shop. It's literally like that. They will, you will be able to go into the Rescale platform and when you get to the point of selecting the hardware, you really have to simply find what is best for your application and you will have many options. Um, but in other verticals of uh, R&D development in the cloud, of course, uh, there is a big problem in terms of the data sharing and collaboration. Uh, so Rescale can help you provision and be that glue that put things together in terms of your data, uh, data journey for your design cycles. Um, also, there is a huge trend right now, which, which is not just buzz, it's real. So for a long time, for many years, there have been many uh, machine learning, AI-driven optimizations. But now this is in, in we're in the process of a very kind of I would say that even like an exponential revolution of how AI is now so accessible, and and then it's helping us enhance R and D and helping to reduce product development by almost half. And we will probably see more and more. Um, and then sustainable computing. Of course, as we continue to grow as humanity and take care of our planet, a sustainable computing is also in the forefront of our, of our work. Uh, it's not a secret that uh, HPC systems and, and HPC data centers, they do consume a lot of energy and, and we're continuously working with partners to also provide and find ways to help you uh, a, make sure that you keep an eye on 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 your HPC footprint, carbon footprint, and make things uh, sustainable. Now, we've seen a little bit of this graph before on Niraj's presentation, and just to reiterate, so the typical trend a few years back was just like you would get a cluster. If you need the speed, you would get a cluster, get more cores, but we can see how that is a, that trend is flattening, right? However, new technologies, new specialized technologies, GPUs being right now, I guess, at the forefront of what's available on the market are still keeping an, a growing trend and, and these technologies continue to evolve. So we expect that in the next 10 years, we will continue to see this sustained growth a, across the board. And, and we're very happy to partner up with, a, with, with companies like CPFD 
where they are, they are also following this trend from the perspective of a software vendor. And then it just makes like a perfect, a perfect partnership. Um, now, what Rescale does is that it doesn't matter what is your application. Um, if you go for a traditional HPC approach where you get single amount of ha hardware, a, a fixed amount of hardware, and perhaps due to budget limitations, you might have to commit to to a specific uh, to certain computer specifications. Then you have a queue. You will have different jobs from different teams from different needs. Uh, that maybe their applications perform differently as well uh, on the hardware, uh, but they have no choice. They will be queued, and this will introduce obviously a delayed time to insight for your projects. With the cloud, and specifically with Rescale, what happens is that you unlock a wide variety, an ecosystem of hardware that you can then uh, uh, you can then optimize your applications, run run your application, optimize uh, uh, hardware options. But furthermore, uh, you have the option that you have an incredible amount of capacity. A, a, and with Grayscale, we we give you untapped access to, to the cloud. And then you can run in parallel different applications from different design teams and move faster and find your, a, your performance and optimization insights a lot faster. And well, in a nutshell, so uh, Frederick actually did a pretty good job describing what is his user journey uh, uh, in terms of using Rescale. Uh, pretty much showed a little part of the of the, of the Rescale UI, where where that's what the users have. They just need they are owners of their simulation. They are owners of the models. But when they need to run HPC, it has to be just easy. And in that sense, is upload your input files, select the software that you want to to use, which it's readily available. We work with CPFD to maintain. The latest version is always available and always up to date and always optimized. So he just needs to pick and click. And then it may, perhaps the hardest choice that he had to make was to select which one of the hardware options that that uh, that are available he could he could tap into. And then we know that capacity in the cloud is wide, but it's also so variable. I mean, there is an on-demand aspect across the globe in terms of using these H100, A100 GPUs that everyone wants to use. Uh, so with Rescale, the advantage is that since we give you on tap access to the capacity of all the cloud providers, you can very quickly pivot, right? If you submit a job on A100s from AWS and there is no capacity, you should be able to pivot quickly to Microsoft Azure and, and so on. If you were doing that yourself, then imagine the full stack of development and engineering and IT on the background that would need to be put together by your company to get there. It's just as hard or probably a, 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 an, an expensive as provisioning actually hardware. Uh, but on the other hand, when you go to rescale, you simply focus on the specs. You have three, four, five, ten choices, and then you use the the ones that are readily available. And at the same time, we provide a control plane for both administrators and users to keep track of their costs, to keep track of their security, uh, and to and well, as as we said before, provision the application that they need. A, 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 and, and have the trust that they will have access to the latest version, both on hardware and both on software, uh, readily available. Um, here, this might look like abstract art, but this is actually a little bit of history on Rescale. This is how we have seen as we have grown and we have had, uh, we have customers from many different verticals across the globe, how the hardware footprint looks in, in Rescale. So uh, and also how the GPU is lately increasing quite a bit in terms of, of of utilization. So you can see that back in 2019, a lot of people and probably when cloud things were starting for HPC, a lot of people was focused on general workhorses in in the data centers. But as more of more capacity, more availability, more software choices, more 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 options are available, then you can see that that spread of hardware, it's aligning with the people realizing that they have the power to simply take what they need that will give them the fastest result. And, and of course, GPUs are on top of there. This is a little bit of a view of what Frederick mentioned when they get to select the hardware. So we have a very wide menu of, uh, of hardware, probably about on more than 110 options from different cloud providers. So we're completely cloud agnostic. Um, and in that sense, you just focus on finding the, the the specs that you need, the number of GPUs in this case for a CPFD simulation that you want to run, and the wall time. And once you have done those selections and you have your files ready to go, it's just a matter of submitting the simulation. And we have 
a, 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 a menu of a A100 and B100 options that are ready to go on both on-demand priority and on-demand economy. Um, and then just to wrap it up here, so we have uh, one thing that we I want to present is touch a little bit about uh, another service from Riskill. Uh, it's tied up uh, uh, to submitting jobs to, to make simulations, but for the question on how do you find the hardware that is optimized, that is best performance, best cost performance for my simulation, then normally you would run a benchmark. On Riskill, we run benchmarks with the Performance Profiles tool. In that Performance Profiles tool, you create a baseline benchmark job, and then you pit that job against different hardware configurations in terms of number of cores or GPUs uh, and, 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 and specifications. And then you run that benchmark, and then you can find uh, very quickly uh, after you have executed these simulations, what is the best performance uh, hardware option. And then that way you can deploy to your teams uh, uh, a guidelines to for our best practices for for cost performance optimization in the in the cloud for your simulation, um, and this is a little bit of what's the administrator journey for that right. A, a, an engineering manager could keep track of their costs and and their spends on the cloud in in a very easy one 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 stop shop uh, through Rescale. Uh, they can look at trends of utilization and then run perhaps decide perhaps to run a benchmark to try to narrow down what is the hardware configuration that's going to be optimal for the simulation. And then they can deploy templates and hardware policies for their users. And that way do an enterprise type of deployment where everyone is aligned in doing what's best for the company in terms of cost and 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 project a uh, project uh, the speed up. And just to wrap it up today, so we have been working closely with CPFD uh, and installing the latest versions of Barracuda Virtual Reactor and running benchmarks uh, on the on the Riskel cloud. Uh, so this is a, a benchmark that that we run on a fluidized bed reactor for acre nitrile <laughs> production and a. The, the figure here is just from a generic a, a reference a, a, from a paper from CPFD. Um, but what I want to bring your attention is, well, we have provided access uh, in, into the cloud to A100 uh, GPU uh, instances. And in this case, this is probably one of the biggest cases as, as I've heard that they've run. Uh, they have half million uh, number of real cells, 60 million clouds, uh, and thermal calculations and uh, chemical reactions are happening in this uh, reactor. It has a, a high memory requirement. Um, and you can see that as they increase the number of GPUs, you can have a, up to a, a, a 200 times X speed up where compared to just running a ser serial simulation. You you already get a great improvement with just one or two hours, but as soon as you have access to more uh, GPUs, this is even, even more impressive. Uh, this is another example of another benchmark that uh, we have been also working with them. It's a circulating fluidized bed reactor. Um, this is a bigger model. Uh, uh, in this case, it was able to execute probably one of the biggest model models that they have uh, run in the cloud. And they have been able to run it up to eight GPUs on eight one hundreds and almost unlock nearly a 500x speed up uh, with, with, this, uh, with this huge model. So, so and well, that is the end of our uh, our presentation today. So next, we're going to move to Q and A. Uh, so let me stop sharing here. I will invite our our presenters to unmute and turn on your cameras if you haven't done so. Perfect. And let me uh, let me let me pull out the questions here. Uh, so we have. Okay, we have one question from our, a few questions from our audience here. Great, thank you so much for your participation. So we have one question uh, from one of our guests here. Um, I guess this is for Frederick. Uh, how do you arrive time step when it takes few hours in real time for filling? I guess this is probably about the time scales of your simulation, if you can elaborate a little bit. Uh, yeah, so uh, Barracuda has the option of actually using a, an adaptive time step. Uh, so in this case, we specified a, a maximum uh, particle current number. Uh, I think it's of one or something like that. Um, and then we just ensure that uh, the time step that we're using uh, is um, is sufficient to keep the um, 
the Quran number uh, below that. So of course it varies depending on the operating conditions. Um, so that's why I think in the presentation I showed a, um, a scale of, of, uh, of time steps that we're using, uh, basically because some cases require a smaller time step than, than others. Um, and that of course has an impact on how long it takes to simulate the, the entire filling. Excellent. So I hope that, that answers the, the question. Hopefully it does. Uh, we are going to anyways have, um, a, we have our, our participants information. So if we have a follow through, uh, feel free to reach out to a uh, reskill webinar organizers and we'll redirect your question to our uh, presenters. Um, okay, so I, I have another question coming in here. Um, I guess this is for both Niraj and Frederick. Did you guys compare results with other numerical methods, DFM, CFD, DM, et cetera? Mm, okay, maybe I can start out on, on the specific case here. So basically what we realized was that it was um, uh, completely impossible almost for us to do uh, this type of simulation with uh, with any other uh, type of software. There is the option of, of maybe looking at a, a very small part of, of the time domain and then only focusing on what happens when you have particles coming out of the fault pipe and then settling on top of each other. But I think that's a really detailed simulation that we could do perhaps with DEM. Uh, but it will not give us any of the type of information on the macro scale that our customer was looking for. So uh, we have, to be honest, not even tried. We did a lot of sensitivity studies before we actually started presenting the results to the customers to make sure that we had the correct time step, that we had the correct number of, of cells. Um, but comparing to, to other methods, we, we haven't been capable of doing for this case. Yeah, and uh, to add on to that, um, I kind of alluded to this a little bit in my talk. I think it's... Uh, what makes uh, Barracuda truly operate in this niche that it does is that ability to to consider the particles in dense and in dilute phases. I think for other CFD tools, they can do very good jobs with particles when they tend to be dilute, either um, with the discrete particle method. Um, but those usually have the assumption that the uh, fluid is not uh, being impacted by the particle as much as its impact on the particle. And that obviously works very dilute flows. But if the particle phase is having that pushback against the fluid phase, then you need to be able to calculate that independently. And there are, are there are methods that like, you know, even the DEM solution, which will calculate particle interactions very well. But like Frederick said, that only works for a very small number of particles before it becomes rapidly computationally prohibitive. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, we have another incoming question, probably related. Um, do you think DEM with SPH methods suitable for your problem? Um, yeah, as I said before, uh, not for the the type of of of, um, of parameters or or results that we're looking for. If you're really interested in, in looking at the details of how the particles are coming out of the fault pipe and 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 uh, colliding with each other just in that um, immediate region, then I think DEM is probably a, a good way to go. For this very large scale simulation over a long period of time, I don't see that as a viable option. Excellent. And I guess that's because of the a very small time scales they will need to resolve, right? And the long amount of physical time that would need to be simulated. Yeah, and, and just the, the, the pro, okay, so you can do coarse graining in DEM, which means that you're basically, um, uh, putting particles together to represent a larger mass than the amount of particles you actually have, but you still need to fill up the hole actually with particles. So that requires a certain amount of particles you need to put in there. And that's just a, uh, yeah, that's a, a problem with, with the DM approach, as I see it at least. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another incoming question here. Is it necessary to simulate the entire filling period to evaluate the filling quality? Uh, yeah, so we had that discussion. I think I, initially I, I discussed this with the CPFD support team, whether this was something we could actually simulate. And they said, uh, we can probably do the entire simulation uh, or the entire filling. I was like, yeah, as if, um, because I, my initial thought was you actually should do it uh, in certain steps. Um, but having the capability of simulating the entire part within a day, I think that's... Um, uh, that, that's what we went for. You can probably do it in 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 a more effective way, looking at only part of it. But we're looking at the 
entire behavior as a function of time. So we, we ended up going with, a, with this solution. All right. Uh, here's another question. Um, Niraj, uh, would, you, would you expect the same speed up trends if you're using V100s instead of A100s? Uh, yeah, uh, certainly. I think that uh, in general, just when you have a, a sufficient problem size, you're going to see speed up from GPUs uh, no matter uh, what. Uh, and with regards to multi-GPU, um, uh, again, it's just it's a function of problem size. So there's kind of this irony where if you can't just keep throwing GPUs at the problem, if your problem size isn't big enough, it's actually going to slow it down because there's these uh, kind of there's this overhead costs of data transfer between GPUs and the uh, algorithms that determine the multi-threading and parallelization, parallelization have computational costs to them as well. So if you keep adding GPUs, it's not necessarily going to get faster if your simulation is not big enough. But if your simulation has this threshold uh, size, uh, absolutely, there's uh, you will continually see growth. Um, and I think when you look at these uh, recent cards, they were, were they do give you this absolutely incredible uh, capacity. Uh, with specifically the V100, the V100 is also a great card. I think anything NVIDIA has put out in the past few years is going to be very powerful. Great, excellent. Uh, well, uh, from Riskel, we can just agree. Um, as capacity of both this, uh, uh, the G latest GPU hardware options are, are available. I mean, the options for you guys to continue developing tools that speed up uh, at the same pace, it's it's right there. Um, we have a few, a couple more questions probably. That's all the time we will have uh, to address. Um, but very excited today about the good participation from an audience. Thank you so much. So we have another question here probably for Frederick. How are you going to validate the results? Bed density testing after turbine installation? That is actually a good question. Um, to be frank, I don't know at the moment. Um, they probably have some um, standards for, for how to do that. Uh, we have at the moment not been involved in that discussion. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's actually a good thing. So I think I'll, a good point. I think I'll return to, to our customer in here how we can probably um, expand in, in that direction and, and have an ongoing uh, discussion on that. So thank you, Action. Yeah, excellent. Thanks to our participant. That's a great question. Uh, we have another one coming here uh, and probably last one for the day. Um, what was the typical average cost per filling simulation? I think you did have a little bit of a number right there. Frederick. Yeah, so yeah, it, it depends heavily on. So we, we just use the V100 uh, with just a single GPU for all of them because they were running fast enough for us, actually, um, which is also the cheapest solution. Um, and I think depending on the simulation times, we were paying up to 60 US dollars for the, the most expensive uh, simulations, um, which is, I mean, compared to the overall cost of the project, uh, when we're doing 15 simulation, that is. Um, in my opinion, quite cheap. Yeah. And what I would like to highlight as well is, and, and I guess this was part of your risk journey, right? You guys enter with a plan of doing, if I heard correctly, about a half a dozen simulations, and, and then you end up doing 12 simulations in total because you have the option to run more and address more questions as your project goes on, right? Yeah, exactly. And naturally, if the cost of doing one simulation would be through the roof, then we would uh, not have done that. So I think the, the amount of simulations that we ended up doing also basically uh, represents or, or signals that that cost is actually quite nice for, for us to include in, in a project like this, even though we are a, a small niche uh, CFD company. I think it's also worth noting that um, when you're talking about these GPUs, even the like the lower end GPUs from NVIDIA are around a grand each, but those high end GPUs, one of those powerful like server racks that has an array of eight A100s, V100s, those could easily get into the six figure range for cost. So, um, you know, to be able to get it on demand at a much lower cost, that is a significantly cheaper route to the infrastructure. Certainly. All right. Well, that's all the time we have today. We were very happy to have you, uh, Niraj and Frederick. Thank you for your work and your collaboration and sharing with us your, your a little bit of your lives. <laughs> so, so thank you for that. Thank you for uh, having us. Yeah, thanks for the invitation.
And thank you to all our participants. Thank you so much. And a shout out uh, to our brilliant Taylor Ratstep. She took care of everything that happened behind curtains on this webinar. So thank you, Taylor. And with that, goodbye. Bye, everyone. Have a good day. Adios.